All right, good evening uh, from uh, Global Chamber here in uh, Metro Manila, Philippines. I'm very excited about the event uh, we have here tonight. Um, so good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good early morning, <laughs> depending where in the world you are. We're very glad uh, that you're joining us uh, for our Globinar today uh, entitled Bridging the Critical Leadership Talent Gap in Asia. I think a very important uh, topic. Um, so I will be your host and moderator tonight. Um, let me just say a few words um, about Global Chamber. Of course, um, many of you may be familiar already with Global Chamber. For those who are not, we're an international uh, business organization. Our focus and mission is really about accelerating cross-border trade and investment. Uh, we operate in every region around the world. Uh, we like to engage with uh, top executives and leaders, um, and uh, we're all about making warm connections. And of course, we're very excited uh, about our partnership with the Heinrich Foundation. Uh, we have very closely aligned missions and that we're very focused again on understanding how to facilitate global trade and cross-border trade. So, um, uh, so it's our pleasure to be uh, pre pre presenting this evening to you in association with the Heinrich Foundation. And in fact, to kick that off, I'd like to uh, introduce Alex Boom, who's the program director at the Heinrich Foundation. Alex has 30 years experience in creating business and education opportunities in global trade. Uh, prior to the Heinrich Foundation, Alex uh, worked in regional roles with Global Sources Media Group, which is a um, and was a business to business trade facilitator uh, between suppliers in Asia and buyers uh, around the world. He's been living and working in Asia uh, since 1987, a long time here uh, uh, in Alex uh, uh, in Asia, Alex. So uh, welcome to you, and, and perhaps you could give your introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Colin, and our panelists and guests uh, tonight, today, as it may be. Uh, I'm Alex Boom, as uh, Colin has said, with the Heinrich Foundation. And for the Heinrich Foundation, advancing mutual, mutually beneficial and sustainable global trade is our, it's our mission, it's our core. And we, looking, we look at approaching trade uh, so in a way that is sustainable, that's balancing the intertwined social, economic and environmental considerations, it's not always intuitive. And in fact, sustainable trade practices must be taught to small, medium and large companies all around Asia to understand what their needs are for that next generation of leadership to help them through these uncertain times and also to grow their business in a sustainable way. And again, and again, and again, we're really looking for those that have the, the mindset to adapt and to grow in their skills from today and well into the future. The uncertainty, the, the nimbleness is critical, but also there's a need for the localization of the talent. And there's plenty of talent here. We're looking at how can we assist companies across Asia with developing that talent, uh, to bring, it, bring them on board and help them grow mo more efficiently, more effectively. So right now our focus is really on truly working with employers to truly understand their needs. So we can help drive their business sustainably. We look at this as being critically important and I'll just touch on the, the uh, what's behind this with the Heinrich Foundation is that we're really looking to global trade is the way that it can help society and nations to build uh, peace and prosperity at the largest level. And that really comes down to the, the men and women and the, the, the companies that are driving trade on the ground. So we're really turning to the firms and those individuals that make the difference every day to make trade better and sustainable to help society. So we're, I'm delighted that we have here this evening some dear, dear friends that we've been working with for a number of years uh, around the region in a number of capacities and to share with you about their journey, our journey, and really look forward to understanding your needs better so that we can work together and help you grow your business sustainably through your uh, talent development, next generation talent development. 
So thank you, Colin, back to you. Great, Alex. Yeah, thank you for that introduction and sort of setting the stage for our discussion this evening. So just to lay out uh, the, our, our flow here, we're very honored to have three excellent uh, guests. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them one by one and ask them to make some introductory remarks. So uh, Warwick Klein and Zoe Dodge and Gail McDonald. So actually, I will start with you, uh, Warwick. Um, let me just introduce you briefly. Uh, Warwick is the chairman and CEO of KPMG in Vietnam um, and Cambodia. He has 20 years experience in Asia. His clients include major international corporations operating in the region across um, several sectors, financial services, manufacturing, natural resources, technology, and consumer goods. Um, outside of KPMG, Warwick is the chairman of the New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, chairman of the British Corporate Advocacy Council in Vietnam, as well as an adjunct, adjunct industry professor in the School of Business and Management at RMIT Vietnam University. I think Warren, uh, Warwick, excuse me, uh, you stay very busy. <laughs> um, so it's a pleasure to have you and uh, perhaps um, I could ask you uh, in your introductory remarks to um, uh, start by painting a broad picture of what you're seeing. Um, what's the industry saying regarding the current leadership and talent challenges and needs across the Asia and, and across Asia? In other words, the, you know, the 50,000 foot view, uh, Warwick. Mm, great. Well, th thanks, Colin. It's really, uh, really great to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction. I so sound a lot more important than I, uh, than I really am and busier than I really am, I think. Uh, but, it, but so it's great to be able to talk tonight about a topic which is um, something I'm really actually very, very passionate about, which is trade. I mean, the trade world, I think, is something which, and international trade in particular, is uh, uh, an industry which has de delivered sort of uh, peace and prosperity to millions and millions of people across the world. And I, as you said, I've, I've had the privilege of living in Vietnam for over 20 years now and really seeing how Vietnam's participation in the global trade environment has lifted tens of millions of people out of out of poverty uh, by enabling them to participate in the global economy through manufacturing activities and so on and of course the you know the import sector and the growth of services and so on and so forth so so trade is exciting and really really um really really important to to me and to uh, and to my business um what are we seeing around talent in it well i think the one of the challenges with the trade world is that it's it's growing uh you know in a country like vietnam the demand for services related to trade is just going through the you know through the roof and that's right across the trade spectrum whether you're in the import export sector or trade policy advisory or dealing with customs advisory and so on and so forth helping um, uh, companies whether directly as an employee or in the consulting industry deal with trade related issues is, is just something which is uh, almost exponential in demand and you can see that's going to continue not only because of the growth of global trade but because of the increasing complexity of the regulatory environment and the and the introduction of um, the complexity of geopolitics into trade you know and how companies and others are thinking I know Alex and others right and think a lot about this much more than I do but um, you know that that has made the world a lot more complex as well when companies are thinking about their supply chains from A to Z and how they build them up and uh, and how they uh, you know go about building teams. From a from a you know individual company perspective at KPMG, we survey CEOs and they um, tell us what the sort of top priorities are on their agendas. And always in the top three is the issue of talent development and uh, uh, whether it's around the uh, you know the recruitment, the retention, or the development of their people. And and that's because organisations, whether they are companies or or um, uh, uh, or advisors. You know, talent is really the the, the most uh, you know one of the most challenging and, and pressing issues. Um, where I think the challenge, and I know we're going to talk a lot about it tonight, is just how we as companies deal with that challenge uh, comes in is around just the the, um, the the demands that are put on people working on the industry through what I just described, increasing complexity. Um, the attraction of the sector to people, you know, do people, particularly in emerging markets, regard trade as a sector that they that they want to get into? And if they do want to get into it, how do they do it? How do they get the skills that they need? And then how do they find good employment in it? You know, that's something that that we have to uh, uh, think about a lot. And uh, you know, I started out in Vietnam as a tax advisor, and it used, we used to talk about market making a lot 20 years ago. 
nobody in Vietnam knew they, knew they needed tax advice. And, uh, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time market making in that field, uh, convincing people just how desperately they needed me to tell them how to do things. And, uh, you know, I think in some ways we're, we're, we're like that in the trade world now, right? We need to make the market to some extent, uh, both with the, the talents coming through and the companies that are employing it. So, yeah, that's, what, that's I think we've got to balance up all of these these. Uh, these, these competing pressures on the supply of talent, the demand for talent, and, uh, and how we bridge it. Yeah, very interesting work. A really good introduction that we've got this uh, situation where there's just this huge demand and then you know, that's really, of course, raises the importance of the addressing the, the, the talent gap indeed. So mm -hmm. next I'd like to go to Zoe Dodge. Uh, Zoe is the Asia Production Head and Country Manager of Allbirds Vietnam. Uh, Allbirds is an international apparel and fashion company specializing in the manufacture, manufacturing of eco-friendly footwear. Uh, Zoe's focus is managing sustainable footwear and apparel production across China, South Korea, and Vietnam. She was formerly the country director and legal representative for VF Corp uh, Asia and Vietnam, and has also worked in Europe and Asia for Adidas, Nike, and Reebok. So Zoe, um, with that excellent background and exposure to different markets. And um, we'd love to hear your observations on the need for the talent. Um, as Warwick said, this great demand uh, and the challenge, but then of course the challenge uh, facing the industry and especially what is Allbirds approach to sustainable leadership development, Zoe? Thanks, Colin. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And uh, it, it's really great to be here tonight uh, uh, speaking with two people from New Zealand when I'm here representing a company that was born out of New Zealand. Um, so we're very, very proud of our New Zealand heritage. Um, All Birds was born on realizing that we have this wonderful sustainable product called wool from the many sheep that are in New Zealand. And um, our, one of our co-founders decided that this was the, the way forward for footwear and apparel. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about that a bit later on. Um, Talent is our, is our biggest uh, challenge within the industry. Vietnam now is making over 50% of most of the large footwear and apparel manufacturers production. Uh, we've seen a huge shift from China um, due to the trade tariffs and, and the difficulties with, um, with, with having a business where the majority of our product uh, is sold in, in the US. Uh, so over the last three years, we've made the shift into Vietnam, along with all of the huge giants of the footwear industry, Nike, Adidas, um, VF, and um, it makes it incredibly difficult to really have any kind of way into the talent that is here. Um, my first problems on, on joining, and I was the first uh, employee for, for All Birds here in Vietnam, we now have a team of nine. Um, next year, we should be increasing to around 25. So we're growing very quickly. Um, and we've had a lot of press over the last few months. Um, we became a public company two weeks ago, um, which has created a lot around our sustainable product and our sustainable um, manufacturing processes. Um, but when I started reaching out uh, around about a year ago, nobody was interested in joining me. Um, they were very, very concerned that uh, we weren't really a, um, a, a reputable brand or a brand of kudos that, that the, the local talent wanted to join. Um, they were more interested in being with a VF who owned Vans and the North Face Timberland uh, or a Nike or Adidas. They didn't see Allbirds as competing. Um, luckily, over the last few months, that's changed a little bit. Um, but to tell you really how we won the, the battle with talent and actually my entire team are very, very talented, um, well-rounded, well-versed um, managers and leaders of themselves. And the way of doing it really was making sure that we were fully understanding of the, the different um, characters and characteristics of good, sustainable leaders, people that were able to lead with empathy that we were also creating those environments, you know, that we were very, very um, aware of any unconscious biases that could potentially be thrown up around our industry. I mean, it's a very male dominated industry, the, the footwear and apparel industry. 
which of course is quite the reverse in Vietnam. You find a very high level of female employees in, in Vietnam. So, you know, it, making sure that we can continue as we grow without those gender biases, without those um, racial biases um, was a huge factor for us. Uh, and we now make sure that when we're hiring anybody else into the business, they go, they go through a panel interview with the team to make sure that that person is a cultural fit, um, that actually the team understand and appreciate uh, areas that are important to them about the new person coming on board. And, and it's become very important to the team. Whenever we're looking at a new position, uh, there's a battle really for who is going to interview that new person. Um, but we took a huge look at the culture of all birds and it's quite we're quite lucky that we have a sustainable business model. So leading sustainably, sustainably came as really part of that package. Um, but looking at all the cultures and making sure that we have a great representation of all of the cultures within our organization. We are predominantly Vietnamese, um, but we do have, um, we do have Taiwanese, Chinese, um, we have a lady from Scotland, I won't hold it against her, but we have a lady from Scotland. Um, so we make sure we embrace all of our national days. We make sure that we share that information with the US. Um, and we created an environment of psychological safety. You know, everybody, um, we have no offices. So everybody sits in an open plan office. Um, it's always an open door policy. And where traditionally I found decision-making quite a difficult um, area to encourage my team, regardless of culture, uh, the team now know that there's no repercussions. You know, I would prefer that a decision was made rather than no decision at all. And if that decision is wrong, then together we deal with the consequences. And keeping that dialogue open, keeping that open, authentic dialogue has been really key to the success of this team. Um, they're very, very quick to want to make decisions. Um, and I embrace that. I think when you, when you start with a team, you can be very quick to get your opinion over. And I used to have anybody sitting next to me, if I started offering my opinion before the team spoke, I would get them to give me a quick kick under the table so that I would keep my mouth shut and everybody else was able to talk. Um, and now I find that I don't have to say anything because everybody's very willing to to open uh, be open with the dialogue um, and that that real psychological safety has been embedded from the beginning. Um, but we're lucky we're a young team, as I say, most of the team have only been on board around six months. Um, I just went away to the to the States and to the UK for a couple of weeks and didn't look at a single email and I've come back to virtually an empty inbox um, because everybody was happy to take that responsibility away from me um, and that's how I want this culture to grow and I think if you respect the people look at how um, their lives the, compl the complexity in their lives um, as uh, Alec, Alex and Warwick were talking about we have flexible working we we appreciate that people live in um, in multi-generational homes uh, so that they can work from home, they can come in late in the morning, they can leave early. Uh, we, have, we have quiet hours on a Friday, so if people have got up early for calls, we, we um, let them take Friday afternoon off um, to make sure that the time's made up. So, you know, really we give a lot, but we also expect a lot back and, and, um, and it, it seems to be a winning formula for us. Well, e excellent. Uh... I'm, I'm really looking forward to exploring, you know, Warwick, of course, was talking about the complexity uh, that we're facing today and the increasing complexity, you know, sort of, the, which of course addresses the technical side of the skills. And now you've also introduced the whole dimension of culture and soft skills and all of that, you know, which are, I think obviously equally, equally important. I'm really interested in our panel discussion to, to explore both of those sides. But before we do that, I, I would like to bring in um, uh, uh, professor Gail uh, MacDonald, uh, uh, um, Professor Emer um, Emeritus of the Global Development Portfolio at RMIT University. Uh, she served as president of RMIT Vietnam from 2014 to 2019. Previously, she was pro vice chancellor of the Faculty of Business and Law at Deakin University and secretary of the Australian Business Dean's Council. Uh, she's also a past 
president of the Australian and New Zealand Academy of Management and has three times been a member of the National New Zealand Performance Based Research Fund panel in business and economics. So Gail, bringing you in, um, I think maybe, you know, by way of introduction, um, I could ask you, you know, what do you see as the primary benefits to industry through engagement with academia in terms of bridging, bridging this existing, you know, talent gap that Warwick and Zoe have been describing? Gail, welcome. Thank you very much, Colin. Pleasure to be here. Um, I think what I've experienced is just a huge demand for well-qualified, uh, well-trained individuals. And with that comes a lot more receptivity by organisations to be involved with universities and academic institutions. And the benefits that largely they receive is in regard to attraction, development and retention of staff. So we tend to find that um, those organizations that are involved with academic organizations uh, find that they can access graduates, whether they be undergraduate or postgraduate um, uh, students, and they can get really quality graduates and they're sort of first in line for those. Um, we also find that um, the whole idea of developing in regard to skills that are really needed and aligned to the industries. So we find that it, there's a lot of benefit there for organizations that are hand in glove uh, with universities. And of course, the last one is uh, to do with retention, where we've found organizations that have supported their staff to go and study gain qualifications that engenders an amazing amount of loyalty that consequently then really does help with the whole retention uh, dimension. I notice I've got a cat in the background here that clearly wants to be involved in the whole story. So, so just very ignore well, that one. The cat is very uh, welcome. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you can, um, while, it, while it probably then goes to the flowers. So just ignore that. I'll, in fact, I will change that so that it's less of him. <laughs> <No worries. laughs> um, but going back to what's the benefits for, for uh, organisations, there are some other benefits as well. Um, for those organizations that really want to be involved with uh, uh, universities, their input is highly valued because the more input that we can get into curriculum development, um, into coursework, into programs, then the greater the alignment that we're going to see between what industry actually needs and what we as a university are, are producing. So um, that's a sort of a bonus because you tend to find that when that's working and working well, there's a lot more currency uh, and the gap between um, a, a graduate student and their usability in an organization uh, is, is in fact narrowed because of that. So, you know, having very contemporary programs that are very much aligned to industry really depends on the input from industry. And having that input is just gold. It really is um, the, the secret source to making an incredible program as we've experienced with the, what we've done with uh, the Heinrich Foundation. I think there's another benefit too that people don't often mention, and that's um, in regard to the potential for actual free consultancy work particularly at the postgraduate level, because we've moved away from examinations and assessing people, you know, sitting down and, and writing exams. Now we're looking at more authentic assessment where you're actually solving a real world problem. And to get the real world problem, you've got to go to an organization and say, well, what problems are you actually experiencing at the moment? And so when you get a team of, let's say, master's students, actually working on an issue in your organization as part of their authentic assessment, then you're getting some real value added and um, hopefully not putting some of the, the, the big uh, consultancy firms out of business. But this is, um, it's small beer uh, in comparison to what uh, Warwick does. But nevertheless, it is a way of actually getting some exposure to the students to what some of the issues are and for the organization to get some input um, and some new ideas. So, you know, focusing on real problems for the organization is, is, is something that I think is a benefit. And of course, for, for organizations as well, they get access to research. 
they also get um, a lot more profile building and um, they also get a broadening of their networks as well. So those are just some of the few sort of, you know, top range benefits that I think a lot of organizations that actively engage with um, a university will actually receive. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, and I'm looking forward to well, exploring that further, the importance of the interaction is what I'm hearing from you between the industry and the academia and, you know, in, in being able to realize those benefits that you're describing. But perhaps we could start off now with the panel discussion um, and, and just scope this a little bit. You know, we, Warwick, for example, you've mentioned, you know, we're at very high levels of demand. Uh, we have this talent shortage. Is there a way to sort of uh, understand um, what is the impact of the talent shortage? How it is, what is the impact that it's having on growth opportunities, for example? Um, how do we understand sort of the magnitude of the problem? Mm, that's great, thanks, Tom. Um, uh, I should have paid tribute to my fellow panelists, actually, because both of them are really good to know. Zoe supplies me with all birds uh, occasionally. Not often enough, Zoe, it's been a while, but really <laughs> helpfully, because they're, you know, hard to get uh, in Vietnam, despite being made here. Uh, but Zoe's great to know for that reason. And Gail actually um, uh, made me or, or tricked me into being an adjunct industry professor at RMIT. So thank you, Gail. So, uh, yeah, and Alex keeps me busy too. So uh, with our Henrik Foundation. So, yeah, really great to, great to be with you guys. It just occurred to me as you were all talking. And look, I think what, you know, what is the cost of not having the talent that you need in the right place? I think that's the sort of question you're asking, Colin. I think that 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 it is a, um, you know, yeah, perhaps from a uh, consulting viewpoint, um, companies go out looking for those free projects that uh, their master's students can give them. Gail. But uh, no, more, I mean, I think more seriously, it's the, the biggest cost is, is bad decisions get made, right? Or some optimal decision. If, if companies don't have the right sort of advice and the right resource available to them uh, in the right place at the right time at the right cost, then those those companies can make the wrong decisions. And I think that that's the biggest cost. And, you know, unfortunately, it's not always obvious to a company when it's going wrong. You know, it may not, it may not, uh, uh, you know, appear until you start losing competitive advantage, or you see your your you know your your competitors um, making smarter decisions than you are. But I think that's that's sort of the number one thing. Um, I think there's a there is a cost in, and and you know we, we're sitting in uh, Zoe and I are sitting in um, you know in a, in a in a high growth emerging market. The 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 there is a tendency in multinationals to have the talent that are engaged in this um, world. In the, in the head office or hub locations. And I think the cost of that is that the decisions don't always reflect the reality on the ground or the perception and knowledge that you get from being in the particular markets. And as the as global supply chains have you know, fragmented and you know, things which are made here are consumed elsewhere and, and so on, the, um, the value in having talent on the ground is what's really, really, I think, important, which is why, why the work of the Henrik Foundation and, and RMIT and so on are really, is really valuable because it enables companies to actually have people in the market, not sitting just in New York or London or, or Tokyo or, or Singapore, but in the market where the goods are being made, where the sourcing is coming from, understanding what the issues are um, around that supply chain. So that I think is, you know, is another sort of a cost if you don't get not only the, the uh, availability of talent right, but where it is, where it's located, getting that right, I think is really critically important as well. Yeah, excellent, Warwick. And you're touching on a topic that I think, you know, Zoe, you also mentioned in your introductory remarks about the importance of decision making. And it was great to hear your own personal experience where you're able to go away and come back and, and have an empty inbox. So, <laughs> uh, but that I'm sure isn't always the case, you know. Um, so, so your thoughts to uh, or reaction to what Warwick is saying in terms of, you know, what, what is the impact um, both amongst decision making um, and any other impacts that you think uh, that the, the talent shortage creates? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, I sit in a very um, unique place right now. The, the business that I work within is, is very US centric. Uh, it's been based out of San Francisco. Um, there were no people in the Asia region at all up until a year ago. Um, so this team, a very small nucleus of people, 
we're very used to picking up from San Francisco and flying into Ho Chi Minh City or into um, Guangzhou or, or Busan um, to be able to just sit down in a factory and, and work through very technical product. Um, and with the onset of the, the global pandemic, that's not been able to happen. So I, I went to San Francisco and met my team for the first time. So I've been uh, onboarded into Allbirds now for 15 months and had never met any of my uh, US counterparts. Um, and it, it was very uncomfortable for them. Um, so they were having to give up that on site, on hand, hands on um, feel of the product and hand it over to somebody that I hadn't even physically met. And, and um, the value of having me in the region came very quickly to them. You know, I'm, I'm very used to running the region, but I also come from a very technical background um, and, uh, and a digital um, technical background, which uh, has been really huge within Allbirds because we're looking as part of our sustainability to digitize as much as we can and, and actually to push our factories into industry 4.0. So, you know, having the right people here then creates more of the right people. And, and um, most of our people come from, we have highly technical product, we have very difficult materials we work with. And a lot of our people are coming from factories they've been working in product development and uh, commercialization which is taking a product into manufacturing um, but yet they the soft skills they need to be able to interact daily with the US teams are lacking um, so technically they're very very good but actually being able to let's say create a something as simple as a, a PowerPoint that is on brand um, is something that is is very unknown to a lot of um, a lot of other cultures um, and so having you know I agree having people like the Heinrich Foundation that are able to bring these talents and not only teach them to um, be able to appreciate and assess global trade but actually teach them really how to communicate within this new evolving world um, has been incredible and I think we've all become um, digital nomads in this in this COVID situation and that itself um, creates problems because before pandemic we were told that no you had to be in your area of, of expertise now you can handle it from anywhere in the world so you know it then brings into dispute whether an expert needs to be physically on the ground when here I am in Ho Chi Minh City and I can't get into a factory um, which is always the challenge for me is justifying the reason that we have people here and not sat in San Francisco because that's where the comfort level is of San Francisco. So that throws up another um, quandary really that I deal with on a, on a daily basis of, if you like, proving the worth of the team here. Yeah, very interesting. And you've, you've of course now mentioned also the impact that the pandemic is having. You know, Gail, turning to you, um, reacting either to what you've heard from Warwick and Zoe, but you know what I'm hearing described is this combination, as I said earlier, between you know emerging technical needs, Industry 4.0, you know, for example, that Zoe mentioned, but then as well as the decision-making capabilities and whatnot. And um, how does that you know sort of factor in to how academia understands um, the, the talent challenge, um, and how does it you know inform your thinking about? Um, in what academia can offer to industry? Sure. Um, I think that traditional qualifications have very much focused on the technical in the past, but increasingly now there's a recognition of the soft skills, if you want to call them that, and the requirement for those. Uh, and that has to do with you know, the whole communication, leadership, um, even down to self-management and stress management. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has to do with uh, sensitivity around um, different cultures and cultural sensitivity, given that we are now you know, a lot more global. So I have definitely seen a change and we've changed as well in order to put those skill sets um, into the programs. At the undergraduate level, they're often run concurrently because the curriculum is very full. Um, but in, um, in a program, for example, like the, the, the Masters of Global Trade, um, which was designed with, with Heinrich, 
there's been an opportunity to actually sit back and say, well, what skill sets are required? What are some of those that we want to put into the program? And in that situation, negotiation skills were just absolutely paramount. And how can we put them in in a very experiential way um, using simulations of trade negotiations, for example? And what are some of the, um, the issues regarding basic skill sets that have often been overlooked as we've become very sophisticated? And for example, sales, you know, just you know, cold calling sales and some of those skill sets that um, needed to be dusted off and brought back into the fore because they were, they were deemed to be important in, in this particular uh, industry. And that was fed back to us from the industry. So I think it's that receptivity to sure the technical skills, but also the soft skills. And then one other dimension is the the flexibility about what's coming around the corner. Because we sometimes tend to think, right, we're done, we're dusted, we've got that qualification, we're good, we, we, we don't need to, to do anything more. We're in fact, in particularly in the area of trade, it is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing these um, gaps emerging quite frequently that need to be then, um, you know, uh, looked into. And so things have got to be rearranged in order to be able to, to take on something like, let's just say even the, the, the digital, you know, in the, in the technical area. I mean, you're looking at optical character recognition for track and tracing. Um, you're looking at blockchain for uh, letters of credit issuance and dropping those down to virtually nothing. Um, AI, I'm not even going to go near there because I know that Zoe's got an MBA in AI, so I'm not even going to, to start giving examples. She can do all that. Um, but, you know, a lot of those, those um, sort, of, sort of really technical areas uh, are important, but also what are some of the changes that are starting to occur? And Warwick mentioned those to do with supply chain and supply chain resilience, particularly given the you know, geopolitical movements that are starting to occur. And there's a lot of other things that are coming up as well. Um, you know, protectionism as a result of COVID. Uh, so not only are we concerned about technical skills and we're concerned about soft skills, but we're concerned about being receptive to what are some of those changes that are starting to happen. And, and being able to filter them and being aware of them, being receptive to them, and then working through what might be the implications for my company or my organization with those. Yeah, so interesting, Gail. You know, I, I'm interested in what you said about the flexibility and change. You know, I think we uh, as humans have, tend to be guilty of what I like to call uh, linear thinking in a non-linear world, you know, where we think yesterday is the same as today, same as tomorrow. And, but now of course we've been through this giant wake up call and experiment called a global pandemic <laughs> and, and, and really experienced uh, firsthand this need to break out of that linear thinking sort of, you know, fixed mindset um, mode. And so Zoe uh, and also you, Warwick, um, you, you know, react to what Gail has said and maybe specifically, how do you see those dimensions that Gail has described, um, you know, when you're looking at, at talent and the impact of your organization? Um, well, I can start and then Zoe can pick up and, and comment on the AI side of it. <laughs> um, but but um, yeah, look, I mean, a, 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 um, Gail described something and I see one of the questioners has repeated, repeated the idea of agility as being something which is really, really important in, um, in, in recruitment now. So if you look at an organization like KPMG, our foundations and our origins come from the audit world. And, and you know, a lot of the people that work here are accountants famously unagile in their outlook and their um, you know approach to methodically working through problems and uh, and so on and in, and in a way uh, a lot of people that come to an organization like us for advice come here for our deep technical expertise and that's something that is a you know a competitive advantage of an organization like ours but increasingly if you don't have in your your professional toolbox the ability to um, think outside that and to be agile in your mindset, and the way you approach a problem, the way you solve it, and so on, um, you're going to be a less successful 
professionally. So we do now in our recruitment and in our talent development put um, you know, an emphasis on those core um, technical skills and the expertise that's required to be an expert at whatever you're doing, whether you're a lawyer or an accountant or a, uh, you know, a management consultant. But uh, agility, things like um, your ability to see the bigger picture, to get yourself above the immediate problem and challenge and see what other inputs might be there. Uh, communication skills, uh, you know, which um, Gail just touched on, so important. Not only the ability to get your message across, but the ability to hear what other people are, are, are telling you and to gather data and uh, and to interpret it. Um, and then some of the, the emerging knowledge and skills around, and perhaps this is a bridge to Zoe, but around, you know, things that are coming out of, um, you know, the, the world of innovation, the innovation that's going on in the world around blockchain or, or AI or uh, other currencies and, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and all those sorts of things. So, so if, you know, I think that the, there's such a, such a complex um, matrix of skills now required to be a successful professional. And you've got to try to assess them at, at the uh, recruitment stage, but equally um, include them in the development stage because you, the things are moving so quickly that you've got to be able to bring your team on into these new worlds so that they're not stuck in, uh, in something which is, you know, really really, uh, you know, becoming old fashioned. And I, I, I don't want to talk too much, uh, go on too much, but you know, when I, when I came to Vietnam, for example, there was a ready set of graduates in foreign trade who were studying import export procedures. It was something that, you know, the, the uh, sort of a, a socialist country was, was pumping out of its universities who were very good at filling the forms uh, associated with the process of importing and exporting. Uh, that is a world away from what people learn when studying trade today. It's so much more complicated and interesting and challenging than, than, than the processes around importing and exporting, as, as important as they are. Uh, so yeah, really, really, agility is, I think, a really key and important concept in recruitment, retention, and development of people. Yeah, you know, uh, Zoe, you know, Warwick makes such an interesting point about, let's call it sort of uh, legacy leadership talent, <laughs> perhaps. Mm -hmm. And what we're really after, of course, is next gen, right? Next gen uh, leadership talent. And I think we've heard quite a lot now about the soft skills. You know, you can weigh in on that, but maybe you could also talk a little bit about where do you see the gaps, you know, more on the technical, you know, we've, we've heard now mentioned AI and blockchain and these sorts of things. Where do, where do you see the gaps um, in terms of what the graduates are coming into the market with and, you know, but versus what's really needed? Yeah, um, no, 100%. I, I agree with um, both what Gail and, and Warwick said. You know, I think the the biggest thing is for um, for in recruiting to take your time um, and to be able to really assess the fit of that person for the organisation it's coming into or they're coming into. Um, for us in Allbirds, being a startup, um, we needed people to really lean in across many different areas of the business that they perhaps um, didn't have experience for, but perhaps had an apt aptitude towards or an interest in. Um, so I think actively encouraging your team to think outside of the box or if we have a project that arrives that none of us have the skill set for we we kind of throw it into a mini tender and we say okay well you know who wants to pick up on this and and um you know you can be the leader and and we'll we'll all come in together so you know very much that kind of collaborative um mindset because that we've we've picked on it many a times that that decision making is not something that is natural and it has to be encouraged and coached, which, you know, I think a lot of you know, RMIT and Heinrich Foundation, et cetera, are doing an amazing job of um, creating those, that mindset change. I mean, it is, it's definitely managing that mindset change. Um, you know, Vietnam is one of the biggest digital hubs anywhere in the world. It has the most creative app developers. I think, you know, there's a statistic out there that I can't remember with my jet lagged head that, um, you know, it produces I don't know, 75% of the world's apps or something, you know, some huge figure like that. Um, so the kids out there are very, very, very digitally aware. Um, and we're having to change our business to really be able to understand that, you know, our, our next generation are, are now buying product in the metaverse and trying it on in the metaverse yeah. 
uh, you know, to be able to see if it's, if they're even buying, you know, you have teenagers being made millionaires overnight because they've bought a piece of land in the metaverse. I mean, it doesn't even exist, but yet, you know, it's tr a, a currency of trade, you know, and, and um, you know, I think these are all things, you know, me, uh, a woman of 50 coming into STEM at my age, um, you know, I've been really encouraged along my journey by uh, that next generation. And I think, you know, sadly the technical skills in the industry are being in my industry are being lost but they're being replaced by many more interesting uh areas that will really make the difference in the industry by we all know that that um our biggest cost of uh, manufacture is in our, in our labor um and we can't sustain manufacturing at the rate of increase of labor and so you know, having these hugely talented um, next generation who are able to understand uh, a, a, land, a land chip put into an automatic stitching machine that is sending data back to, you know, a, a digital twin, which is enabling us to create a product in the virtual space is really the area that is going to drive us forward to sustainable manufacturing in these regions. It's not going to be being able to use money to throw an extra headcount on the production line to increase productivity. And I think that's really the gap we need to look at and nurture in our younger generation um, to not only try and give them the, the basics of technical skill, but to be able to give them the ability to explore what comes natural to them. They, they live in a digital world. Yeah, very good. So I think you've, the three of you have done an outstanding job of describing, you know, what the situation, what, what the needs are. And are, so let's come to the, the, the question of the hour, I think, which is how do we solve this? <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we get industry involved um, along with academia? You know, where do we start? You know, um, maybe I can go to you first scale, you know, how, how does, in, how can industry help academia prove, improve its approach or what, you know, how, how do we engage between academia and, and industry to, you know, to get sure. our arms around solving this problem? There are a number of different avenues by which industry can engage. Um, so let me just talk about some of them at, at a very practical level. Um, you, you'll find that most programs will have advisory boards around them. And those advisory boards are there to provide input to um, suggest changes uh, that are required to look at graduate outcomes and what sort of graduate profiles, what is it that we're trying to produce through a program. And so putting your hand up for one of those types of activities, we're always looking for guest lecturers. We're always looking for people to come in and give the war stories of things that they have experienced um, and you know, what they did to solve the problem, et cetera. Um, so we're also looking at research opportunities. Most universities are chopping at the bit to get, you know, and lift the bonnet of, of some companies and do some research. So that's another way of engaging. And of course, taking the graduates because you'll find that most universities now have placement offices for either work integrated learning, which is more of a sort of a subset of some exposure, um, or for actual graduates and always looking for mentors um, mm -hmm. and um, advisors for, for students. So those are just some very sort of practical levels. Perhaps Warwick, you might want to talk about your role and what you do as an adjunct. Yeah, thanks, Gail. I mean, I just I was reflecting then the first time you and I met, apart from um, drinking a bottle of wine each, perhaps, um, <laughs> that, uh, um, you asked me a question which you might not have expected the answer, which is what are, what is what do I what do I what do I feel as an employer of graduates from your university at that time? And KPMG were one of the bigger employers of graduates uh, coming out of the University of Vietnam, and I said, you know, they're wonderfully talented, smart young people, but actually the biggest problem is they're kind of unemployable. And I remember you being quite shocked. And um, maybe that's why you knocked back that wine so quickly. No. <laughs> um, but my point was, and you took it well, was that um, you know, they weren't coming out with all of the skills, the real, the real skills of being employees. They were learning, you know, they were in another world, if you like. And I was like, you know, if they're gonna work at a place like KPMG, they're gonna have to know how to do this, this, this. And you rightly challenged me 
to um, address that by getting involved, uh, which you know, I, you know, which I did. And as, as an organisation, we've worked with RMIT and others and giving that feedback directly and helping the institution understand that it's not operating in a vacuum, it's in the real world. And we, we love employing graduates, but um, we just had 302 start here last month in Vietnam. Um, yeah. Some of whom come out of RMIT and others out of other universities here. But, but you know, we, we need them to be work ready. And, you know, that work ready element is important. And to be that, we have to work together to, to um, um, you know, advise on what sort of skills they are. And that's through the, the industry advisory bodies and what have you, what sort of skills do we need? Um, but also, in, you know, in my case, getting into, into the classroom. And, uh, and, and uh, one thing uh, Gail explained to me when, um, uh, uh, describing what it meant to be an adjunct professor was that I shouldn't worry too much because adjunct is Latin for not up. And um, there's an actual real professor in the room as well, uh, which is true. Right. And, uh, but, but, you know, what I've been doing is uh, going along and sitting in on some of the classes uh, and providing some real world input to the people that are going through the, the, the MGT program. I know Zoe does similar, similar things because I've, I've heard from some of the students uh, that they've learned from her. So I think that, you know, that sort of active engagement is something that is really important. And, and I think you were right to call it out as an employer, all very well sitting back um, complaining that the graduates we employ don't have, you know, are kind of useless. Um, far better to get involved and to help uh, solve that problem at source by, by, by giving them the the, the institution, the knowledge that it needs to train them and the students, the, the real life experience. So that, yeah, that's what we do. It's really a matter of working together. And I'd encourage other employers to do the same. I think the more that we do it uh, as a partnership, the better, uh, you know, the, the better the, mm. the value is and the, the more work ready those, those, those kids are or young adults are when they come into the workforce. Uh, so that's how we've yeah. found it. Yeah, that, indeed. You know, Warwick, you mentioned, I think the key word there, partnership, you know, so could you you know, sort of weigh in on that, how you see the partnership best working between academia and industry to, you know, to, to, to solve these challenges that we've described? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, the uh, Master of Global Trade, RMIT, you know, is a perfect example. We, um, I was part of that from quite early on, um, being able to um, give a view on the, on the different parts of the course, be able to highlight areas that, we're really missing in industry has been absolutely key and um you know we talked about it earlier as well it's it's a huge um retainer of staff you know if you're able to be able you know with the help of heinrich foundation to be able to offer scholarships to these types of programs it you know it it really um gives a huge amount of loyalty to to your company um, in return and and you know part of that scholarship is that you're not allowed to bond your your um your students which you know i think is fabulous because you know if 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 a um, employee is going to leave you you know they're they're going to leave you regardless of whether you know they've had the had the training and and really it it the onus is on you to then be providing those graduate schemes to be able to maximize the the areas that they've learned within those um within those lectures and courses to be able to make sure that you're you're keeping um, that talent engaged and, and that talent is staying with you. Um, you know, we've all, we've all spoken about it, but I think mentoring and, um, and being a, a sponsor to, um, to the uh, young talent of, of uh, you know, our future leaders is huge. And I think uh, for every young person that I mentor, I probably get more out of the relationship than they do. Um, I think being able to just understand the world through their eyes and you know especially a lot of them are my my target consumer um so i think it it's hugely valuable and it's hugely valuable to understand yeah it's usually around you know levels of you know fear of of um underperforming or fear of you know not really saying the right thing when you're in a in a um important meeting or you know you're having to present um you know that building that confidence and and um, those soft skills um and to see those people move up through the industry and and you know start to excel and have you know huge success in their careers is is really rewarding and i think that's what you know keeps me wanting to to give back and i'm thankful to 
um, the, the university, and I, I lecture into a lot of UK universities as well. Um, you know, I'm very thankful to be able to do that because you know, it, it keeps me current and, um, and it enables me to give something back. So I think it's of huge importance. Uh, that's great. And it's great to have folks like yourself and Warwick who are willing to, to do that. So you know, we're rapidly using up our time. We do have some questions. Um, maybe, um, Alex, if I could ask you actually just to weigh in briefly on, you know, what the discussion, the, the direction of discussion has gone and, and just speak again a little bit about, you know, the role of the Heinrich Foundation in, in evaluating these challenges and especially focusing on on the solutions. Maybe you could just weigh in a little bit on that and I'll absorb a couple of these questions and then we'll end with the questions. Okay, great, I'll, I'll keep it um, high level. Thanks, Colin and, and my dear friends on the panel. The, as Zoe said, really working with, together with industry, what are the needs? And then working with Gail and RMIT to develop a, the master of global trade, which is, we say it's developed by employers for employers. So we really started with, with scratch and he said, okay, a master's program with nested um, areas of development, what do you need? We built it up in literally in workshops, putting different courses on the board. And then every course was vetted by, um, by industry. So it's all approved by the proper authorities, but we had some uh, industry input for every single course. And every course, and thanks to um, Zoe and Warwick and many others, Every course we have um, at least four industry speakers in the class to make it current. And then after the course, we also have a review. So we can review the, that course uh, on a, um, right after every offering of it so that it's current. And we can't wait two or three years to update the curriculum uh, with the, the speed that things are going now. It has to be quick. The other aspect of what, what Zoe pointed to, uh, the scholarships that we're offering we can't do this um, on our own. As a foundation, we can assist others who have the talent and the time and the businesses to have people go forth in, in trade because we see the trade is helping society so much being so critical. So we're really just uh, uh, leveraging on our what we can do with the education part to help the companies do what they do best, which is trade sustainably. So it's been a fantastic journey for us. And it really comes back to by employers for employers and having that uh, relationship to make things work for all parties. Yeah, excellent. So we, I think we have time to uh, tackle a couple of questions that have come in. We have one from Dotan uh, in Israel and uh, he, uh, Dotan agrees uh, with the discussion about how things are changing so fast and whatnot. And, he specifically brings up the topic of developing women in digital leadership programs um, as an integral part uh, um, of, of traditional leadership. And, um, you know, what do we see in that area? How do we predict, you know, uh, um, and how do we involve uh, women in, in, these, in these programs? Um, uh, Zoe, could, and uh, perhaps you could weigh in, Gail also. Yeah, it's still a huge area where there's a, a, a huge gap between male and female going into those STEM programs, which is is um, is sad and worrying because we're we're losing a lot of potentially very talented data scientists and um, data analysts and scrum masters, and you know, out of those those areas, um, it it. I believe it just takes us to keep inspiring and keep opening opening doors. Um, I think the more females that are able to blaze new pathways and and um, supply chain is is not really a very female orientated um, pathway. And I believe more females tackling those areas leaves a pathway open to other females to follow. Um, I, I personally, whenever I do any any call, I say, you know, I'm open, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm more than happy to speak with anybody, um, male or female, um, about their, their thoughts and ideas. Um, you know, my own story, I, I, I grew up in a, a time period where my parents couldn't afford for me to go to university. So I went straight into an apprenticeship in, in footwear manufacturing um, and have always had some form of imposter syndrome because I, I don't have education like other people 
um, around me. And so I've self-funded my MBA um, in artificial intelligence, which um, absolutely astounds me to this day. Um, and I'm also now doing my DBA, um, expanding on my um, artificial intelligence, which is around digital twin. Um, so, you know, I think we just have to keep opening those doors and, you know, anybody that wants to track me down, I'm easy to find, um, you know, please do drop me a line. And if I can help with anything, then I, I certainly will. Um, and the more females that blaze this trap, this path um, is going to be the way really that we, we show that, you know, we've, we've got that equal seat at the table. Excellent. Gail, I invite you also. Um, well, Zoe's really um, walking the talk there because one of the things that they've found that is most instrumental in encouraging women into leadership roles is, in fact, role modeling and having role models around the people that have done it, um, are people that have been successful in those, those roles. And so um, it's really trying to pick people in your organization that might be happy to do that mentoring, to do that um, uh, advice, give the advice and, and encouragement um, because the, the imposter syndrome is alive and well. <laughs> And a lot of people think, oh, I, I really shouldn't, you know, go for that job. Um, and they always say that, you know, when, when a woman goes for a job, she's usually 110% prepared for the job. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's really about role modeling and encouragement. Absolutely. Well, I want to be respectful of the time. I, you know, we've, we've used up our, our, we have some um, Great uh, feedback coming in, by the way. Uh, thank you, Joe. I see your comment. He says, what a fantastic panel, I must say. And I hardly agree. Uh, it's been an excellent discussion. Um, just give you each just a, uh, a just real brief uh, final thoughts um, before we wrap. Um, maybe you could start with you, Warwick. Uh, yeah, thanks, Colin. Look, I, um, well, it has been a great panel. You guys are just, <laughs> just pondering some of the things you just said. Role modeling and, and woman leadership is a, is a, a, a hot topic for me, as well as just, um, I want to say platforming, but giving, giving people the ability to be heard. So, so and, and tonight we've had the opportunity to be heard, and including my panelists. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, like Zoe, I'm easy to track down and uh, welcome engagement from anybody that wants to explore these issues further. And, and as I say, I'm hot on this topic of trade is something which is, which is um, uh, great for Vietnam and for emerging markets and, and uh, men and women workers around the world as well. So uh, thank you very much. And consumers too, of course. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you, Warwick. Gail, any closing comment? Um, yeah, there was just one that came to mind and that um, was when I reflected on the organizations with which um, academia has had very successful relationships. And one of the things that characterized those relationships was that it was with more than one person in the organization. There was a depth and breadth to, to mm -hmm. it. So, you know, if Warwick decided he didn't want to be in his role anymore and wanted to be, you know, Prime Minister of New Zealand, then um, these programs would still go on. There, you know, the, 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 there is a depth and breadth to, to um, the partnership. And as a consequence, um, they're very enduring. Yeah, absolutely. And Zoe, closing thought? Yeah, I think leading off of uh, a little bit from what Gail said, um, you know, the our young leaders and young managers think very differently about their career paths. They're, um, they're not necessarily looking to be in one role for a huge amount of time. Um, and I think being agile as a business to be able to facilitate movements within the business um when i interview i i always ask i hate the question i hate when anybody asks me but you know where do you want to be in five years and my intention is really and it's a horrible question my intention really is is to understand if they actually do want that role they're interviewing for or whether they're looking to do something completely different within the organization um and i'm 100 percent supportive of that you know sitting down with each individual and creating individual development plans to bridge the gaps to get them to where they want 
to be means that I retain that talent that I've spent a long, a lot of time and money um, growing in in the business, even if it's not in the role that I initially recruited them for. So um, I think agility in our people that we're looking for, but also agility is our business to to change to the way our leaders view their career paths. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. So Alex, I'd like to thank you and especially also the Heinrich Foundation for the excellent partnership between Global Chamber and the Heinrich Foundation, the important work that uh, you're all doing and raising this Im important topic. Um, perhaps I could uh, uh, have you give your final thought and uh, wish everyone well. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much, Colin and Global Chamber. And it's I just like to share with everybody that the the panel, I, it's it's not a random collection of people. They're all near and dear to the foundation. I've had the uh, joy of working with them and learning from everybody along the way. And as we go forward and learn together to help advance the talent and um, our business in a sustainable way. Thank you all, everyone. Good night. And thank you very much to our audience, too. And uh, stay safe and healthy. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.